No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America. Episode 3, The South, Part 1. Mexico. What is happening south of the border that drives people north across the U.S. border? There's no single answer. Each case is different. Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras do not comprise a homogenous context, nor is any one of them internally homogenous. What they have in common is that many people with citizenship in these countries cross the border to the United States to live and work, and that these workers provide American employers with much of their lowest paid labor. South of the border, many of these same workers also provide the American economy with many of its cheap agricultural products and much of its cheap manufacturing labor. Aside from this, the four countries differ culturally, economically, historically, and in nearly every other way. Let's look at each of them in detail. Mexico. If you talk to some people in the United States, You get the impression that everyone who sets foot on Mexican soil is immediately robbed, decapitated, and murdered. At that rate, you'd think everyone in Mexico would be dead. In fact, one can go from one end of the country to the other and mostly be surrounded by people calmly going about the business of their daily lives. On Christmas Eve of 2014, I was in San Cristobal de las Casas, and the air was ringing out with explosions of firecrackers as hundreds of cheerful people hung around the Zocalo together playing with balloon animals and drinking atoles with their kids. Mexico has grave and explosive problems, but it's a far cry from Syria. My suspicion is that even in Syria, people are still calm and happy sometimes. To understand the cycle of events that push and pull people across North America, we have to scrutinize the aspects of Mexico that are ugly and brutal. But that's not the only story to tell, or even the most interesting one. It would be just as edifying to write about the stunning biodiversity of Mexican punk rock, or to explore the significance of the phrase, no mames guay, or to sing the praises of the seven moles of Oaxaca. It is true that Mexico can be dangerous, even deadly. It can also be harmonious and safe. The same can be said of Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and the United States. As I alluded to above, A slim majority of the Mexican citizens that I met in the desert were crossing the border primarily to return to their homes in the United States. A considerable minority were crossing primarily to get away from the violence and instability that is sometimes referred to as the Mexican drug war. Virtually all were driven at least in part by the knowledge that they could make a better living in the United States. Why this particular constellation of factors? Mexico and the United States have history, of course, and there's no need to reiterate it at length here. It's enough to say that Mexico has been the site of over 500 years of struggle, first against slavery and colonization, then to win independence from Spain, then to resist being absorbed by the United States, then to expel the French, then against the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, and recently to end the 71 years of one-party rule under the PRI, the Institutional Revolutionary Party. Mexico gained its independence as a sovereign state in 1821. By 1854, it had lost more than a third of its territory through sale and invasion by the United States, including most of what is now the American Southwest. Hence the phrase that I've heard in southern Arizona more times than I could count. We didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. For a long time, migrants from Mexico provided American farm owners with most of their lowest paid agricultural labor. Many farm workers would come to the United States seasonally, work in poor conditions for low wages, and return home. Lacking the rights of citizens, it was very difficult for them to organize to win higher wages or defend their interests as workers. This was the context in which the United Farm Workers were organizing in the 1960s. More recent efforts by migrant farm workers to act collectively include the 1998-2004 Farm Labor Organizing Committee boycott of Mount Olive Pickles, and the 2001-2005 to campaign of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, a Penny Moore campaign targeting Taco Bell. 
The passage of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, in 1994, changed the equation. In addition to its ruinous impact on American industrial communities, NAFTA inflicted truly catastrophic damage on Mexican agricultural communities. In preparation for the agreement, the Mexican government amended its constitution to allow for the privatization of communally held campesino and indigenous ejido land, undoing a major accomplishment of the Mexican Revolution. NAFTA then permitted heavily subsidized American agribusiness giants such as Cargill and Archer Daniels Midland to flood the Mexican market with cheap commodities from the United States, especially corn, rendering farming untenable for millions of Mexican campesinos who could not hope to compete on such a scale. This may seem to contradict my previous statement that imported goods are often more expensive in Mexico than in the United States, but it does not. Corn is a commodity which is grown in both Mexico and the United States. To dominate the Mexican market, American agribusiness must compete with Mexican growers. In this case, the point is not that American corn sells for more in Mexico than it does in the United States, but that American corn sells for less in Mexico than Mexican corn does. A version of this process, in which small farmers are driven out of business and off their land, has played out in the United States and many other countries around the world. This was the background of the Zapatista Rebellion in the southern state of Chiapas. The participants correctly identified so-called free trade as an existential threat to Mexican campesinos and indigenous people, predicting that this agreement would mark a final death blow to their way of life if they failed to resist. The Zapatistas rose up in arms on New Year's Day in 1994, the same day that NAFTA went into effect. Exactly as the Zapatistas predicted, NAFTA drove millions of rural Mexicans many of whom were already living in desperate poverty, off of the land and straight into the abyss. This set off a massive wave of migration as millions of people left their homes to find work in Mexican cities, in sweatshops primarily owned by American corporations along the Mexican side of the border and across the border in the United States. A great many Mexicans went to the United States around this time and began to set up lives there. Starting in 1994, Internal deportations and border militarization on the American side increased dramatically, intensifying again after the attacks of September 11, 2001, and snowballing ever since. Border militarization has made crossing the border so difficult, expensive, traumatic, and dangerous that the former pattern of seasonal travel between Mexico and the United States is almost entirely a thing of the past. If someone makes the commitment to cross the border now, it's usually to stay for a substantial period of time. Consequently, undocumented people constitute a permanent segment of the U.S. population, a caste without rights totaling at least several million. Migration from Mexico to the United States peaked at some point in the mid-2000s and has been tapering off ever since, largely due to the strength of the Mexican economy relative to that of the U.S. following the housing crash of 2008. Since 2012, the Pew Research Center and various other analysts have reported net zero migration from Mexico to the United States. This may be statistically true, but it misses the point. Working in the desert, I met huge numbers of Mexican citizens throughout this time. This is because the American government deports untold thousands of people every year, who in fact live in the United States, and most of these people will cross the border again in order to return to their homes and children. It's hard to say how many. The government is not forthcoming with these statistics. Not to put too fine a point on it, but this revolving door is not the situation that net zero implies. That's why a slim majority of Mexican citizens that I met in the desert were crossing the border to return home. What is referred to as the Mexican drug war is usually portrayed in the United States as an ongoing, low-intensity, asymmetric war between the Mexican government on one side and various drug trafficking cartels on the other, with the government's principal goals being to put down drug-related violence and ultimately to dismantle the cartels. This is all wrong, except for the adjectives. And I don't believe I've ever heard a single Mexican from anywhere on the political spectrum describe the conflict to me in those terms. In fact, the conflict consists of ever-shifting alignments of state and non-state actors 
competing for control of the fantastically lucrative transportation industry that delivers drugs and undocumented workers to the United States. Calling it a war on drugs is like calling the invasion of Iraq a war on oil. The war is so convoluted, and the alliances between cartels and factions of the state shift so rapidly, that describing them brings to mind Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. We can pinpoint the positions of the participants or their properties, but never both at once. The simplest possible version of the story is that there are two unequal centers of gravity, the more massive Sinaloa cartel and the more energetic Zetas cartel, with factions of the Mexican state, as well as any number of smaller cartels affiliating with one side or the other, as circumstances dictate. The war began in earnest in 2006, when the administration of then-President Felipe Calderón began to involve state forces directly in a way that they had not been involved before. It has raged on interminably ever since, and the violence in some parts of the country has been outrageous, claiming over 120,000 lives as of 2016. The places most affected have included Ciudad Juarez in Chihuahua, the central state of Jalisco, the northeastern states of Tamaulipas, Coahuila, and Nuevo León, and the southern states of Michoacán, Guerrero, Veracruz, Oaxaca, and Chiapas. It's worth sketching out a portrait of the main actors in this drama. The Sinaloa cartel, based in the northwest and with agrarian roots, is a most extraordinary organization. It is probably the most successful drug trafficking network that has ever existed, and it has demonstrated a long-term vision and a supple grasp of strategy, surpassing those of many national governments. It overlaps with the government of Mexico to such an extent that it is just as correct to say that the state is part of Sinaloa as it is to say Sinaloa is part of the state. Both statements are true. Some American analysts express concern that Mexico is or may become a failed state. They need not worry. The Mexican state has not failed. It is the most successful criminal enterprise the world has ever seen. Sinaloa's boss of all bosses, El Jefe de Jefes, Joaquin Chapo Guzman, is at five foot six, a figure of such epic proportions in the Mexican cosmos that to compare him to Robin Hood or Sauron would be to vastly overstate the stature of either of those characters. This man has, supposedly, escaped from prison twice, once in a laundry basket and once on an underground motorcycle. As of this writing, he is supposedly in custody. No Mexican I have spoken to is entirely convinced. Sinaloa portrays itself as the lesser of two evils and claims to fight a cleaner war. It accuses the Zetas of victimizing civilians and committing atrocities. We are drug traffickers, not murderers, they say. We don't mess with honest people. This is self-serving and in bad faith, but there is truth to it. Sinaloa's basic strategy, elegant in its simplicity, is plata o plomo, silver or lead, the bribe or the bullet. Sinaloa's reputation is that it will make an offer to do things the easy way, that it will keep its promises and pay its debts, and that it will be more than capable of doing things the hard way, if need be. Sinaloa is the house, and the house always wins. One cannot help mourning the fact that the people at the heart of this project, many of them the children of campesinos and undeniably organizational geniuses, did not apply their talents to radical social transformation or some other wholesome pursuit. I usually hear Sinaloa referred to in the singular. By contrast, the Zetas cartel is based in the Northeast and has its roots in the military. Members of the Mexican Army's Special Forces Corps, GAFE, founded the organization in the mid-1990s. The founders were among the roughly 500 GAFE personnel that special forces groups from the U.S., Israel, and Guatemala trained in counterinsurgency and commando operations at Fort Bragg in North Carolina in order to combat Zapatista rebels in Chiapas. Somewhere between 30 and 200 of these soldiers made use of this training by immediately signing on as enforcers for the Gulf Cartel, a well-established drug trafficking organization and at that time, the Sinaloa Cartel's primary rival. Before long, the Zetas became more powerful than the Gulf Cartel itself, eventually turning on their employers and striking out on their own in 2010. The Zetas are indeed a special force. Their core cadre is composed of a rogues gallery of mercenaries and defectors from every branch of the Mexican military and police, as well as more than a few from those of Guatemala and the United States. <laughs>
Armed to the teeth, rolling in cash, expertly trained, and utterly without scruples, the Zetas have introduced a new level of brutality into the ecosystem of Mexican organized crime, surpassing anything that came before. While Sinaloa has always claimed to avoid civilian casualties, the Zetas go out of their way to incur them at every turn. The Zetas' former captain, Eriberto the Executioner, Lazcano, a widely known sadist generally regarded as the devil himself by anyone I've ever heard mention his name, was supposedly killed in Coahuila in October 2012. However, gunmen stormed the funeral home where his body was, supposedly, being held and whisked it away, never to be seen again. Nobody seems to know quite what to believe. The Zetas cultivate an image of extreme ruthlessness, and they make no pretensions to abide by any kind of ethical code. They promise to fight as dirty as possible, and they deliver. They accuse Sinaloa of rank hypocrisy, of engaging in most of the behavior that it denounces the Zetas for, and of being in collusion with the government. We are murderers, they say, but we are not liars. There is truth to this. In some ways, the Zetas' honesty is almost refreshing. The Zetas' basic strategy, attractive in its way, is to overturn the board if they can't win. In a furious push to dislodge Sinaloa from its place at the top of the ladder, the Zetas have transgressed every boundary of acceptable behavior, committing such a catalog of crimes against nature, humanity, and God that it boggles the mind to recount them. In many ways prefiguring the Islamic state of Iraq and Syria, ISIS, the Zetas came to the same conclusion years earlier and half a world away. It is possible to build a fearsome army and to make a lot of money by putting guns in people's hands and giving them license to break every rule. It's doubtful that such nihilism could ever be part of a project of liberation, but one cannot help mourning the fact that the Zetas did not decide to unleash hell on the top of Mexican society rather than on the bottom. I usually hear the Zetas referred to in the plural. The war can be read as an ugly perversion of a conflict that cuts to Mexico's core, the conflict between campesinos, who gave birth to Sinaloa, and the military, who gave birth to the Zetas. The peculiar twist is that it is Sinaloa that is most closely tied to the loyal factions of the state, and the Zetas that are most closely tied to the rogue factions. Just as many Mexican soldiers are a generation removed from their agrarian roots, most of Sinaloa's leadership was born in the 1950s, while most of the Zetas' leadership was born in the 1970s, a generation later. There is an air of patricide to the conflict between the two camps. In Tamaulipas in South Texas, one can advertise for the Gulf Cartel by displaying John Deere regalia. One can advertise for the Zetas by displaying Porsche regalia. The branding of the two camps is telling. Part of the appeal of the Zetas is that they are not your father's drug cartel. The same generation gap divides the leadership of Al-Qaeda, the 1950s, and ISIS, the 1970s. Some of the dynamics between them are similar. The third term in this equation is comprised of Mexico's many social movements. A great part of the violence in Mexico is actually the repression of social movements masquerading as a drug war, especially in the South, which has long been much poorer than the capital or the North, and where those movements have traditionally been the strongest. Mexico has a rich history of radical struggle and thought. From the caste war of the Yucatan to the revolution and the original Zapatista movement of the 1910s, from the protests and occupations in Mexico City in 1968 to the uprisings in San Salvador Atenco and Oaxaca in 2002 and 2006, from the siege of San Juan Copala in 2010 to the self-defense forces now standing guard over Santa Maria Ostula and Chiran, from the modern-day Zapatistas firing the first shots in resistance to the global capitalist hegemony of the post-Cold War era more than 20 years ago, to the ways that their concepts of autonomy and self-determination have informed contemporary struggles, from Oakland to Rojava. Mexicans have contributed immeasurably to the project of liberation. It is probably not a coincidence that the event that is usually viewed as the starting point of the drug war, Calderon's deployment of 6,500 Mexican army soldiers into Michoacan in December of 2006, took place within two weeks of the suppression of the uprising in Oaxaca in late November. The war in Mexico is a clash of elemental forces, personified by three groups of people in black masks with guns. Order, Sinaloa, Chaos, the Zetas, and Transformation, the Zapatistas and other associated rebels. It's not clear how this war will end, or what will happen when it does, 
But for now, it is not surprising that there are many Mexican citizens who cross the border primarily to get away. The world is getting smaller, though. This trialectic is playing out similarly in Syria, personified by Assad, ISIS, and the revolutionaries in Rojava. Such conflicts are spreading, and eventually there will be nowhere left to run. And what can be done then? Borrowing a couple of points from the late Charles Bowden, I'll answer this as best as I can from my vantage point as a solidarity worker in the United States. The government of the United States bears a great deal of responsibility for the conflagration that has consumed Mexico over the last 10 years. As I described above, by imposing NAFTA, it decimated the Mexican agricultural sector and threw millions of people who were already poor into absolute ruin. This, in turn, created millions of internal and external migrants and refugees, many of whom eventually turned to the cartels rather than starve. The prohibition on the use and sale of street drugs in the United States keeps the prices of these drugs artificially high, creating huge profit margins that are fought over to the South and feeding the multi-billion dollar drug industry at the center of the conflict. By deporting hundreds of thousands of people and militarizing the border, the U.S. government has created a human trafficking industry closely linked to the drug industry, with billions more dollars at stake. By providing the Mexican government with money, weapons, and military training, it fuels the violence from all sides. These resources invariably go rogue as both state and non-state actors use them to vie for control of these industries, not to mention for the purpose of repressing social movements. None of this is an accident or a mistake. In fact, the war in Mexico, like the suffering in the desert, benefits identifiable sectors of society on both sides of the border. Official policy on these matters represents the interests of those sectors, and this is not going to change anytime soon. If the government of the United States really wanted to hasten the end of the war in Mexico, it could do so by ending deportations, opening the border, legalizing the use and sale of street drugs, and cutting off military aid to the Mexican state. These actions would have other consequences, some of which I will speculate on later. However, they would take most of the oxygen out of the conflict by removing most of the profits and most of the means to fight over them. If this took place, I have full faith that Mexicans would be able to figure out how to sort out the problems of Mexico, as they have done in the past. Needless to say, this is not going to happen. There is no political will in Washington to take any of these actions, or from the American public, outside of a radical fringe. Those of us on that fringe can try to compel the government to change its drug and immigration policies. We will probably at least succeed in shifting the grounds of the debate. It may be easier to change everything, or else to hang on while everything changes around us. Until then, people will cross the border, whatever the risk, whatever the cost, and no matter what obstacles stand in their way, by any means necessary. San Salvador Atenco in the state of Mexico is revered throughout the world for two uprisings that took place there, one in 2002 and one in 2006. In 2002, Atenco was the planned site of Mexico City's new international airport, and much of the community was slated for displacement. After ferocious clashes between police and community members organized under the umbrella of the Community Front in Defense of the Land, the government canceled the construction of the airport. It has never been built. In May 2006, at the same time as the beginning of the uprising in Oaxaca, as well as the day without a Mexican strikes walkouts in the United States, a second uprising erupted in Atenco following the expulsion of a group of flower vendors from the nearby Texcoco market by police. This is not as unusual as it may sound. The harassment of the millions of such ambulantes, or precariously employed street vendors, is widespread throughout Mexico, and a source of much resentment. The state used an overwhelming amount of violence to put down the second uprising. Over 4,000 federal, state, municipal, and private police terrorized the entire community, killed two people, beat and injured many more broke down doors and arrested 207 people without warrants, and then raped and otherwise sexually assaulted 26 women in detention. The episode remains infamous over a decade later. <laughs> 
A woman from San Salvador, Atenco, in her mid-60s told me the following story in 2010 while we were taking part in an attempt to break the paramilitary siege of the Triqui community of San Juan, Copala, and Oaxaca. When we decided to stop the airport, we studied what the Zapatistas had done. We saw that the Zapatistas had prevailed because they had made a myth for themselves, and that they had been able to make a myth for themselves because they had a magical outfit, their ski masks and rifles. We knew that if we were going to stop the airport, we would need to make a myth for ourselves as well, and that to do this we would need a magical outfit of our own. But we didn't know what this would be. It couldn't be that of the Zapatistas. That would make no sense. We were not Mayans. We were not guerrillas. We didn't live in the jungle. We were campesinos from a small town outside of Mexico City. What could our magical outfit be? We argued about it for days, weeks even, and finally we found it. A cowboy hat, a red bandana, and a machete. Once we found our magical outfit, we were unstoppable, and the airport was doomed. To this day, residents of San Salvador, Atenco, can be seen with cowboy hats, red bandanas, and machetes on the barricades of struggle across Mexico. When they show up, it feels like the cavalry has arrived. You've just listened to episode three of No Wall They Can Build, a guide to borders and migration across North America published by the Crime Think X Workers Collective. Stay tuned next week for episode four, The South, part two, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. This audiobook is a production of the X Worker Podcast Collective. You can check us out at crimethink.com slash podcast. To order a print copy of the book, read a free PDF version online, check out the poster that accompanies the book, or learn more about the anarchist struggle for a world without borders visit crimethink.com slash borders. To learn more about No More Deaths and solidarity work in the desert along the U.S.-Mexico border, visit nomoredeaths.org.